Okay, good morning, everybody. We are looking at our second class on the Spirit, which is holy. And uh, we'll be studying this morning the um, prophetic promises from the Old Testament. And I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. I believe one of the biggest reasons why people have misunderstandings about the Holy Spirit is because talking about what the Holy Spirit was going to do in the Old Testament is something that is sometimes neglected. And if we understand these things, we will understand some of the things that the New Testament is saying with more clarity. Um, and so, uh, just as a reminder of the schedule, classes two through four were emphasizing how the Holy Spirit is talked about in the Old Testament. We could do more classes on it than what we're going to do. But next week, we're going to be talking about the prophetic promises in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, and then after that, we're going to look at individuals who were empowered by the Spirit, uh, like some of the judges, uh, the people who helped to make the tabernacle, things like that, and how Jesus is ultimately the one who is empowered by the Spirit to do the work that God has called him to do. Uh, and then classes 5 through 9, dealing with the New Testament. And again, that's going to be the section that's probably most subject to change depending on some of the comments and some of the questions that you guys have, things that maybe you feel like are missing here, I'm more than happy and open to hear anything that you guys want to hear discussed that you fear is not on there. Um, but for today, we're going to be looking at the prophetic promises from the book of Isaiah and the book of Joel. Let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, uh, we love you because you first have loved us. We thank you for keeping your, your covenants and your promises that through the bloodline of Abraham, the whole world has been blessed and been offered blessings. We pray that, that we would be people who are fixated on Jesus and what he's done and that as we study the Holy Spirit, we would understand the Spirit's role in these blessings that we have. Help us, Father, to look at the scriptures honestly and to speak in the way that your word speaks about these things. Help us to become more equipped and able to answer the questions of people that we know in our friend groups, in our workplaces. Thank you so much for uh, the work of the Spirit and what he has done for us. We pray that we would understand this, these things in a way that would be pleasing to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, uh, just as a review from last time, uh, what does the word Spirit mean? Breath. Wind. How do you know if something's alive? It has breath if it's breathing. And so uh, the idea of the Spirit is it's, it's part of God that gives life to that which is dead. Um, all right, good. What are some works that the Spirit has done that we talked about last time? Sanctification in 1 Peter. Com yeah, it brings comfort. We talked about that a little bit. What was that? Yeah, gave life to Adam, uh, was involved in creation in some way. What else? Intercedes for us in Romans chapter 8. Uh, good. So those are going to be some of the things that we'll expand on as we go through these classes. But let me just explain the purpose of these classes. Why are we doing these classes? Here's a, a few things to think about. Number one, deepen our understanding of a difficult topic. I don't know that any of us are ever going to feel like we understand everything about this. We talked last time about the differences of a mystery and a puzzle. Uh, a puzzle is something you can solve. A mystery is something that you can kind of have some understanding of, but there's going to be places upon which you can't have full understanding. And when we're dealing with God, that would make sense that we would say that about the Father. It makes sense that we would say that about the Son. And it should make sense that we would say the same thing about the Spirit. But in saying that, there are certain things that we know the Spirit doesn't do. And uh, we'll be talking about some of those things as we go through these classes. Uh, also, uh, speak how the Bible speaks regarding the Spirit. This is not a topic we should be afraid of speaking about the way that the Bible speaks about it. Um, and so I hope that as we look at these passages, we'll become more comfortable talking about these things the way that the Holy Spirit has revealed through the Scripture. And then be equipped to help other people understand. And there's other purposes for these studies that we could add to that. Uh, but for today, I want to first of all uh, think how a first century audience would think. 
when John the Baptist comes on the scene, when Peter's preaching in Acts chapter 2, and they talk about the baptism of the Spirit, or the coming of the Spirit, how would people in the first century, in, in the beginning of the Gospels, how would they think about those ideas? And so I want us to think about that concept and then how the books of Isaiah and Joel would inform those first century audiences on what the coming of the Spirit would mean. Does that make sense? Any comments or questions? Because sometimes when somebody look, goes to a New Testament passage about the Holy Spirit and they go, oh yeah, I think that the Holy Spirit's going to give me a dream or a feeling or a nudge or something like that. Uh, and that's what I see with the Holy Spirit doing. And uh, Well, how, how would the original audience of the New Testament letters have understood these things? Was the original audience largely people who knew the Old Testament? Yes. And so what did the Old Testament say about the Spirit? So that when, and, and you can look at this passage, for example, in um, Mark chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. And he preached, saying, this is John the Baptist, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, when this promise is given by John the Baptist, you don't see the audience going, well, I sure wonder what that means. We, we've never heard of anything like this. Maybe that means he's going to give me a feeling. Maybe that means he's going to give me some kind of like a, a nudge on my heart to make me, help me know who I should marry or what school I should go to or what town. You don't have anybody wondering things like that in these passages. What would this audience, who is John preaching to? By the way, he's not just preaching to the 12 apostles here. And we'll say more about that when we get to Acts 2 and Acts 10. But who is he speaking to here? Jew or Gentile? Jews. Did they know the Old Testament? Yes. So oftentimes what people will do with this passage is they'll go, okay, baptism with the Holy Spirit. Let's jump forward to Acts 2 when the Spirit comes and Acts 10 with Cornelius and people can speak in tongues now um, and we move forward but forgetting that the original audience would have first looked backwards to the promises of the Spirit in the Old Testament. And if we understand those promises, then we can have a better understanding of what John was saying here. Or Acts 2.38, if you repent and you're baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Did, did the original people that heard that from Peter go, I sure do wonder what that means. How would they have been informed on what it would mean? How would they know? Yes. Yes. Um, th this audience, I don't think would have had a hard, hard time understanding what the gift of the Spirit would have been. Uh, I don't think that the people that were hearing John the Baptist preach would have had a hard time understanding what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. And people today that are very charismatic, if you were to ask them, okay, baptism of the Spirit, what does it mean? Well, it means that I'm going to, you know, do all these charismatic things. Okay, where are any of these promises rooted? Where, where did they derive from? Was there, do you know the Old Testament passages that talk about this? And a lot of people don't know these things because the promises of Jesus in the Old Testament, Isaiah 52 and 53, Psalm 22, there's a lot of great promises of Jesus in the Old Testament. What promises of the coming of the Holy Spirit can you just go, oh yeah, that passage? What was that? Joel 2. Yeah, Joel 2, and that's going to be one of the ones that we look at today. But Joel is not the only one. And if we know the other ones from the Old Testament, we can begin to understand this goes much deeper than speaking in tongues. This goes much deeper than being able to do miraculous things. We'll wrap that part of this up this morning as we telescope out to the New Testament. But um, here's this question, then, and we've already kind of danced around the answer to this. The original hearers of these passages would have been Jewish. They would have known the Old Testament scriptures. How would we learn to think like these original hearers to better understand the original meaning of these references? We have to study the Old Testament. Do you guys have any, uh, any questions or thoughts or comments before we start looking at some Old Testament promises of what the Spirit was going to do in the New Covenant? Do, do, do you see how what we're about to do 
makes better sense with Scripture than just starting with all the questions that people have today that are disconnected from the promises of God in the Old Testament. we got to start with what God says about these things and lay that as the foundation. Do you guys understand? Okay. Go to Isaiah 32. There's two primary passages that we're going to look at in Isaiah today. There are other passages we could look at. Um, that we're going to reserve, Lord willing, for class number four. But I want us to get a general sense of what's happening um, in the book of Isaiah uh, before we start looking at Jesus being the one who's going to be most empowered by the Spirit and whatnot. But um, let's start out by reading. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and just put all the questions here, um, and then we'll walk through the text. But the questions that I want us to think about in Isaiah 32 is, what's happening to Judah in this context? Uh, describe the condition of Jerusalem before the Spirit comes. And then describe the condition of Jerusalem after the Spirit comes. Okay, so let's begin in Isaiah 32 in verse 9. If you have the printout, I don't have as much of the text on there. So if you have your Bibles, you'll, it'll, you'll be better off having your Bibles open for this. But look at Isaiah 32 starting in verse 9. Rise up, you women who are at ease... Hear my voice, you complacent daughters. Give ear to my speech. In a little more than a year, you will shudder, you complacent women. For the grape harvest fails, the fruit harvest will not come. Tremble, you women who are at ease. Shudder, you complacent ones. Strip and make yourselves bare and tie sackcloth around your waist. Beat your breasts for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine, for the soil of my people growing up in thorns and briars. Yes, for all the joyous houses in the exultant city, for the palace is forsaken, the populous city deserted, the hill and the watchtower will become dens forever, a joy of wild donkeys, a pasture of flocks. Let's stop there for now. What is, in the book of Isaiah, what's going to be happening to Jerusalem? Yeah, they're going to be besieged. First of all, by Assyria, and Assyria is going to be sent away because one angel will kill 185,000 uh, uh, soldiers in one night. Uh, so the immediate threat in Isaiah here is the Assyrian uh, besieging them. The Assyrians are going to be sent home, who eventually will take uh, the nation of, of Judah captive. Babylon will. And so Isaiah is talking about how you guys are going to have some judgments come upon you. Uh, it's going to start out with Assyria, and they're going to do a lot of bad things to you. Eventually, you guys will be taken captive, and in verse 14, what's the city going to be like? It's going to be deserted. Uh, all the shops, everything. It's going to be wild animals living in these kinds of places. And, and so further, let's further describe the condition of Jerusalem from verses 9 to 14. Any other observations you guys had about what's going to be happening to the nation? Yes. Yeah, good. What else, John? What was that? Yeah, everything's going to be stripped bare. Like in, in verse 13, the soil is going to grow up thorns and briars. Where's the first time in the Bible we read about thorns and thistles or thorns and briars? Genesis. So it's like this land is going to have God vacating it. Uh, this land is going to be cursed. And it sounds somewhat like what happened in Genesis chapter 3 after sin entered the world. So because of the sinfulness of the Judeans, God's going to have this land that was supposed to be flowing with milk and honey sort of become like what happens in Genesis 3. What else do you guys observe here? Yes. Yeah, this place, it's a dry, barren wasteland. There's no life here. It's not a kind of place that you want to be. Were you going to say something like that, John? Dry and thirsty land. Good, good. Any, what else? Yes. Yeah, the consequences of being complacent. And here, Isaiah is specifically talking about the women. The women are also given some judgments in chapters uh, three and four, um, somewhere in there. Um, 
And, but Isaiah, is, he's very even-handed. He judges the guys and the girls and how all of these people collectively have created a lot of the problems in the nation, and they're going to be judged for it. Okay, so in, let's keep reading. In, in, unless, does anybody have anything else through verse 14? Do, do you see that um, it's almost like Jerusalem's going to be made into a desert or a desolate place? Where did John the Baptist do his preaching? In the wilderness. Does it seem like Jerusalem's going to be made into a wilderness here? What's the significance of John the Baptist being a voice in the wilderness? Well, because of the sinfulness of God's people, they're going to become like a wilderness. And then John the, John the Baptist, his voice breaks through in the wilderness, pro- proclaiming this baptism of the Spirit. Well, where did he get these ideas? Look at, starting in verse 15. So all of it is going to be this way. What's the first word in verse 15 in y'all's translations? Until, all right, until the Spirit is poured upon us from on high, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is deemed a forest, then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places." And it will hail when the forest falls down and the city will be utterly laid low. Happy are you who sow beside all waters, who let the feet of the ox and the donkey range free. Okay. What's the spirit going to do? It's going to rejuvenate the land. What is the spirit being pictured as? What was that? Being poured. It sounds like rain. Have you guys ever seen rain before? Um, uh, so when we lived in California, it, we, were, we were lived there during uh, one of the more recent droughts. And um, whenever it rained in San Diego, the, like before it rained, all the mountains that we'd go hiking around it was just all dirt. Just brown. Uh, and then probably like five to eight days after it would rain suddenly the mountains had green on it. And it would last that way for maybe like 10 days and then it would go back to the dirt color. Um, But as as surely as rain would be poured out onto the dry ground, you knew that there was going to be green vegetation afterwards. And so the spirit is being compared to rain on a dry, thirsty land. Does that fit the imagery that we've already seen of the spirit in some of these other passages? That the spirit gives life The Spirit is something that brings rejuvenation and blessing. Do you see the imagery there? What else do you guys observe in verses 15 to 20? What else is going to happen when the Spirit is poured out? Fruitful field, it's going to cause fruit to grow. Does that sound like any New Testament passages? Like the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy. So as the Spirit, as the blessings come to us, as we see the things of the Spirit... Does, is it supposed to cause growth in life and rejuvenation? Yes. What else do you guys see here? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep, good. What else? Yeah, there's going to be righteousness and peace. So the blessings of the Spirit. So the original audience of this, and in the book of Isaiah, would they start longing for the time when the Spirit would be poured out? Would they go, okay, we're connecting the outpouring of the Spirit with the restoration of the kingdom, with God taking our people and making us into what we were always supposed to be. That's what they would start to understand the pouring out of the Spirit to mean. Or baptism of the Spirit. Same kind of idea. Yeah. Yeah, we've got to know that we need it. Uh, We've got to be able to receive it. And that's part of what John the Baptist is telling people. Get ready for the one that's going to baptize with the Spirit. Good. Uh, Verse 19 is a tricky verse in this context. And it will hail when the forest falls down and the city will be utterly laid low. Well, I thought he was just talking about blessings. 
Um, sometimes in the book of Isaiah, there's a couple ways of looking at this. Sometimes in the book of Isaiah, he'll talk about these blessings in the future, but what has to happen before those blessings ever come? And that would be the judgment of Jerusalem. That still has to happen first. But eventually, in verse 20, uh, you're going to be able to let your ox and your donkey range free. There's going to be so much grass. It's going to be a peaceful place with no predators. Um, it could be that he's talking about that, or it could be saying in verse 19 that God will defeat the enemies that oppose the spirit, and that'll be part of what brings the peace. You could look at that either way. But any other comments or questions that you guys see about the... Yeah. Yes, this is a very good question. Is Isaiah being totally literal here that Jerusalem will be a place that's just inhabited by wild... No, there are still people that lived there. Now, it, it was... It, you guys know what the word decimated means? Uh, the word decimated means a tenth. So sometimes when people say, oh, it was decimated, and they say it was completely destroyed, actually that word only means a tenth because it's a decibel. Uh, so it's not decimated. It's like it's desolated. It's been destroyed. There's still people living there. Um, and when they return, it doesn't feel like totally secure. We just saw in Ezra and Nehemiah that there were still enemies and things like this. So it seems like, well, some of this has a degree of showing of fulfillment in Ezra and Nehemiah, it's all ultimately a spiritual picture of people that are dry and thirsty. And would Jesus come and give imagery about if you listen to the words that I speak, you'll have life and you'll be blessed he tells the woman at the well, I have living water that I can give to you. He tells Nicodemus, you have to be born of water and spirit. Do you think they would have been informed by pictures like this? They would have had to have been. Any other? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Yes, good, good. Anything else so far? Is this making sense? If anybody has any questions, if you've never, if you've never looked at Old Testament prophetic promises of the Holy Spirit, this might be like, okay, whoa, like this is, this is a little bit different for me. If anybody wants me to clarify anything, please ask. I don't want to leave anybody behind here. Yeah. That's one of the ways that you can look at what the gift of the Holy Spirit is. Now, when we get to Acts 2 in more depth, I'm gonna, I plan to give three different ways of how you could look at the gift of the Holy Spirit, all of which I think could make sense. But I think, I think part of what's going on when he says the gift of the Spirit is how would the original audience have understood the gift of the Spirit? Taking something that's dead and giving it life. Is that not what happens when somebody's baptized? He, God is taking somebody who's spiritually dead and he's giving them life. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and then Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that talks about the washing of regeneration by the Spirit. That the, All of that connects together. But do you guys already see how, if, if you've not thought about these promises before, it starts to go, okay, it's not what a bunch of people have been saying, uh, maybe that I have charismatic friends that, that say this or that. Do you know the Old Testament promises that would have uh, calibrated the expectations of the Jewish people? Here's another passage. Go to Isaiah 44. We're going to basically see the same idea here. Um, but I still want to look at this just so we understand that it's not just one passage that brings this up. And we can ask the same questions here. Describe the condition of the land before the Spirit comes. Describe the conditions after the Spirit comes. Look at Isaiah 44 starting in verse 1. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, 
Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurim, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. This one will say, I am the Lord's. Another will call on the name of Jacob and another will write on his hand, the Lord's. And the name himself and name himself by the name of Israel. Okay, uh, what do you guys think about these questions? What's happening before the Spirit comes? What happens after the Spirit comes? Yeah, thirsty land. Good. Uh, what happens after the Spirit comes? Blessings. What kind of blessings? Descendants. What was that? Yeah. It, it, it's kind of like a compacted version of what we saw in Isaiah 32. But can you imagine being one of the original readers of Isaiah and you see in Isaiah 32, okay, we're going to be destroyed, but the Spirit's going to restore us. Uh, and then you go 12 chapters later and you go to Isaiah 44, same idea. We're going to be like a, a, a wilderness. And the thing that's going to transform everything is going to be the Spirit. The Spirit is going to give life to that which is dead. Because Spirit means breath. If you have the Spirit, you have life. You're breathing. The nation's going to be breathing again because of the Spirit. Any other thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, Brian? Brian? Yes. Yeah, and these people, they have this intimate connection with God now. Um, we're going to see when we look at Ezekiel, Lord willing, next week, that one of the marks of having the Spirit is you're careful to do everything God has told you to do. Uh, but they have this deep connection now. Patty? Okay. All right. Anything else? Yes. Yes. Uh, and, yeah, the Spirit's... Uh, has this water connection. I'll pour water on the dry, thirsty land in verse 3. Again, so when Jesus talks to Nicodemus and he says, you have to be born of water and spirit. Do you understand why Jesus could say to Nicodemus, are you not the teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? Haven't you looked at some of these passages that talked about what the spirit was going to do and how it's compared to water and how, uh, what's the first time in the gospels that spirit and water are found together. Jesus' baptism. Jesus is baptized in water and the Spirit comes upon him. And that happens in John chapter 1. So in John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and he says you have to be born of water and Spirit, as readers of John, the only other time that water and Spirit's been brought up is in baptism. Baptism in water and you receive the Spirit at the same time. Uh, in the new, Yeah, but in, in Genesis, yeah, you got the Spirit of God hovering over water in like manner, if the Spirit of God is hovering over water at Jesus' baptism, it's showing that Jesus is bringing about a new creation. All right, any other questions or comments so far? Because we're going to spend the rest of our class looking at Joel. And um, there's other passages. So go to Joel chapter 2. And this is the, the passage like that Patty brought up that I think most of us would be familiar with because it's quoted in Acts chapter 2. But we can sometimes think that this is the only Old Testament passage that's promising the coming of the Spirit. The, and I'll, before we start reading from this passage, let me point out that this is the only Old Testament promise about the Spirit that talks about miraculous abilities. This is the only one. Um... I'll wait to bring that up, but it is important to know that this is the only one, and there's reasons for that. From what we've seen in Isaiah, is the big deal of the coming of the Spirit that everybody's going to do miracles in Isaiah 32 or Isaiah 44? Is that the big deal of the coming of the Spirit? What's the big deal of the coming of the Spirit? Life, restoration. So why would there also be miracles associated with this? We'll, we'll work our way towards an answer to that. In the context, 
Uh, God's people have not been living like they're supposed to be. God's going to be sending locusts to destroy them in chapter 1. And so they're going to be made into a wilderness. But, look what, but if they repent, God will bless them. Look at I, uh, Joel chapter 2, starting in verse um, 20. Well, okay, how about this? Before I read in 228, go, back, go down to chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. Just stop there. So what happens at the end of chapter 2 is the Spirit's going to be poured out. And in chapter 3, verse 1, what does he say is also happening here? The restoration of God's people. So the coming of the Spirit, again, is associated with that restoration. This is a unique one, though, because it deals with miraculous abilities. Go to chapter 2, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes." And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said. And among the survivors those, uh, uh, those be, uh, shall be those whom the Lord calls. Okay. Um, what's going to happen in this passage to all flesh when the Spirit's poured out? Prophesying. What else? Dreams and visions. Uh, What else? Anything else? Yeah. It's all flesh. It doesn't mean that literally everybody on earth is going to receive these kinds of things. But what would all flesh mean? All mankind. Jew, Gentile, whatever. And in the book of Acts, you see these kinds of blessings coming upon... Jew and Gentile. We do. With Acts chapter 2, we see it in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. We see it in Acts chapter 8 in Samaria, where the Spirit is given in a way that can cause people to do miraculous things. Uh, Okay, here's something else here. What is the great and awesome day of the Lord in this passage? So in this passage, he's talking about the restoration of God's people, but there's also going to be blood and fire and columns of smoke. Sounds kind of like the baptism of the Spirit and the baptism of fire, like John the Baptist talks about in Matthew chapter 3. What do you think this judgment is? Right, so who's being judged? Maybe the world... What about Jerusalem in 70 AD? The people that are rejecting these blessings of the Spirit that should have known these things? That in the time when the Spirit is poured out, you're going to have a choice. Are you going to receive the blessings? Or are you going to fight against it and be one of the people who are judged? Okay, now, what we have to start figuring out then is when the New Testament talks about the baptism of the Spirit... Does it always mean the miraculous abilities when there's only one passage that talks about it that way? But Isaiah 32 and Isaiah 44 seems like the bigger deal, the weightier thing about the coming of the Spirit is the restoration of God's people. So what, why does the baptism of the Spirit also include miraculous abilities? Does anybody have any thoughts about that question? Yes. Yeah. What's the? Were you going to say something, Patty? Yeah. So, what's the purpose of miraculous ability? Um, yeah. Go for it.
Yes. Yes. Good. Um, what's the purpose of miraculous abilities all throughout the Bible? Confirm the word. To confirm what God is doing. Does anybody know the three eras in the Bible where there are miracle workers? There's, it's not like it's happening constantly in the Bible. There's only three eras where there's miracle workers. Anybody know what they are? What was that? Moses, yeah. What's the first, what's the first, some of the first stuff that Moses does? Remember he takes his staff and um, he turns it into a snake and then you've got the uh, Pharaoh, the magicians, and uh, was it, did they actually turn something into a serpent or were they serpent um, charmers who knew how to make him like straight? Like there's some people that have been able to do that, I guess. But what does Moses' serpent do to the magician serpent? It swallows it up. And I think that's kind of a picture of what God is going to do to the nation, uh, to the army of Egypt. What happens to the army of Egypt in the water? They get swallowed up. Same Hebrew word is used, by the way, in Exodus 15. I think that's also in Exodus 7 when the serpent swallows up the other one. That is, yeah, cool. Okay, yeah, my, my serpent's stronger than yours. But what? it's a symbol that you guys are going to be destroyed right at the beginning before the ten plagues even start. Um. Why is Moses doing these miraculous things? Why did God give him the ability to do miracles in Exodus 3 and 4 when he's arguing with God about, please, you know, I don't, I don't know about this or that. And then God says, well, here's, you know, do this thing and it'll get leprosy and then put it back in and it'll de all the Like he's giving him all these abilities. Uh, for what reason? Yeah, to show that all these things that we're doing, this is really coming from God. And God is going to show that the magicians in Egypt can't get past duplicating the first two plagues, and that's not even helpful anyways. Uh, the second period of time in the Bible where there's miracle workers is Elijah and Elisha. And that's during a time period where God's people are not believing in the truth. God sends these prophets to challenge the people, and he's giving them all these signs and wonders through Elijah and Elisha to show if you want to know what God says, you're going to find it through these people. And then what's the third era where there's miracle workers? Jesus and the apostles. And then, according to Joel, are there going to be not just the apostles, but other people that are going to be prophesying? Do, do we not see that in 1 Corinthians, where there's lots of people that can speak in tongues there? There's people that have different miraculous abilities. In Acts chapter 8, when uh, the apostles go to Samaria, do they give them just non-apostles the ability to do miracles? Yeah, like it's distributed not to every single Christian. But it's distributed to many different kinds of people. For what reason? To confirm that the days of the Spirit's blessings of restoring people that are dead has now come. So if you look at Acts chapter 2, uh, this is very familiar. You can turn your Bible there if you want with the time that we have left. Why might this passage be the one that Peter quotes in Acts chapter 2? Of all the other promises in the Old Testament of the coming of the Spirit, why quote from Joel chapter 2? They would know that one. Why else? They were doubting the validity of his words. They were saying he's drunk. And has the Spirit just been poured out in such a way to do miraculous things? Why else might he be quoting this one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yes, and, and the message of the gospel is so significant that Jesus is the king now, and, and the spirit is revealing this message that's going to change the course of human history. 
How do you know that these, these days have really come upon us? Because we as Jewish people, we've been waiting and waiting for the coming of the Spirit to give life to that which is dead. How do we really know that God is restoring his kingdom? Because he's not doing it physically with the nation of Israel. It's a spiritual reality. So what's the evidence that he's really creating his kingdom now? Were you going to say something, Amy? Yeah, and through the judgment against Jerusalem, he's going to lead his people out from another kind of tyranny. Yeah. Anything else on this? So, so when you see John the Baptist saying, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit in, in Mark chapter 1, um, don't read into that, oh, that's just talking about the, the Spirit giving people the ability to speak in tongues in Acts chapter 2, and the Spirit doing the same thing in Acts chapter 10. Because who is Peter preaching, or who is Mark, uh, John the Baptist preaching to in Mark chapter 1? You're going to be baptized with the Spirit. Is he just talking to the apostles there? I'm not even sure that they're there. The, the, the baptism of the Spirit, is it a blessing for everybody that comes to the Lord? Yes. Does it mean fundamentally that everybody will do miraculous things? No, it doesn't mean that. The miraculous abilities were the sign that the Spirit has been poured out. And it's the confirmation that these days have finally come. That's, that's the purpose of miracles all throughout the Bible. I don't think it would be different there. But have you ever heard people say, well, in, in, when John the Baptist is saying, you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, well, well, there's probably some of the apostles there when he said that. Well, Cornelius wasn't there. Do you see how it seems like a bigger promise than just for 12 guys? Do you guys see any comments or questions? That, I, that's probably different from what you've heard before. Any comments or questions? Is, ever, is it confusing? Do you guys get what we're saying here? Yes. Right. Yes. 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 It's gonna. It's gonna be by means of the spirit. Um, the original audience wouldn't have gone, woo, cool, we're all going to be charismatic now. No, it's the miraculous abilities confirm that the deep realities are true now. And, and God's going to let people from all tongues and nations have these miraculous abilities for a period of time, so, and they're gonna, these things are going to be written down for us so that we can know that these days were kicked off with, with authentic things that show that he's still using his spirit to give life to that which is dead. Yes. Yes. And yeah, and, and to, this is an interesting point. I hadn't thought about this before until you just said this. Um, do we need miracles today to confirm that the exodus really happened? No. Do we need miracles today to prove that Elijah and Elisha were real? Do we need miracles today to prove that these days of the pouring out of the Spirit is giving life to that which is dead? Do we need miracles today to prove that? No. We have them written down, though. Uh, and so I think that's, and in Acts chapter 2, the, the, the tongues coming on the apostles. I think it's the apostles only that it's coming on, and we'll say more about that when we get to that passage, um, is a way of explaining, okay, you guys know from our own scriptures that this is what the expectation was, and these days are here now. The Spirit's coming and giving life to that which is dead through the message of the gospel, which is a message that's going to change the whole world, and this message is so significant and weighty that it'll take people and transform their life and take people who are dry and thirsty and like a wilderness and make them fruitful and have them cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, things like that. Is this, is this starting to make sense? Okay, we're going to do the same exercise, Lord willing, next week with Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel has his own ways of describing the coming of the Spirit. And then we'll connect what Ezekiel says to some things in the New Testament. Um, and then eventually we'll start looking at more detail within these New Testament passages uh, themselves. But please feel free to challenge me, to ask me questions for clarification, whatever. Um, and it, and uh, that, that would be helpful for me to know how everybody's understanding what we're talking about. So thank you for the good discussion. And we are done.